right, today we're going to discuss something that we haven't discussed for many, many years, COVID. But specifically, we're going to focus on something that some people got affected by as a result of the initial infection. The idea that's sometimes referred to as the long COVID. Automatically referred to as post-acute sequela of COVID-19 or PASC. Something that actually has become a bit of a global health crisis. Because a lot of people had these very bizarre persistent symptoms, very often lasting months and sometimes even years after the initial infection. But even today there is no exact definition or specific symptoms that everyone seems to experience. As a matter of fact the list is very large and there seem to be a lot of symptoms affecting a lot of different body parts. But the main symptom most people experience seems to be fatigue. And so technically this is defined as a group of health problems that persist or develop after the initial COVID-19 infection, something lasting weeks, months or years. And the thing is, some of these symptoms can be quite debilitating. We're talking about some of the most extreme tiredness imaginable, usually after a very simple physical or mental activity, or the sudden feeling of shortness of breath, muscle pain and severe cognitive dysfunction. This has officially become known as the brain fog. And well, as of 2025, researchers have now identified over 200 individual symptoms that have now all been linked to the initial COVID exposure. And the sheer scale of understanding this is enormous. As a matter of fact, according to current estimates, anywhere from 10 to maybe even 30% of everyone infected by COVID either have or will experience some form of long COVID. And as of today, over 400 million people have already been affected. But crucially, nobody right now knows how to even approach treating this, and we don't even have standardized testing equipment or standardized tests to try to diagnose any of this. Which is why a lot of different studies in the last couple of years have tried to focus on basically trying to find the underlying problem here, or the specific biological mechanism that's possibly causing at least some of this. And that's essentially what we're going to be doing today. We're going to dive into this one recent study that possibly identified something. Here we have a promising recent discovery focusing on a very strange tiny structure discovered working in the blood of certain patients, with this finding potentially suggesting a direct link between persistent inflammation inside the body and abnormal clotting effects inside the blood, which possibly may provide both the reliable diagnostic tool and maybe even a roadmap for future treatments. And so let's discuss this new discovery and a new study that as always you can find in the description below and talk about what scientists believe this is and how this could possibly be treated. But I guess first let's go through some of the more obvious questions and possible answers. Why does COVID-19 even have these lingering effects? And why do people experience so many different symptoms as a result of long COVID? Well right now scientists believe there is really no single cause but possibly multiple overlapping mechanisms, all resulting from the initial infection. Here is roughly how this can be all summarized. First, there might be some kind of an autoimmune response. The virus might upset the immune system, causing it to sometimes mistake the body's own cells as something that needs to be attacked, thus causing inflammation. Or maybe there is some kind of a viral persistence, with the virus itself or parts of it remaining inside the body, even though the initial infection was already cleared. And so by hiding somewhere in the body, for example inside the gut, it just keeps triggering additional inflammations, thus causing more symptoms. Alternatively, this can also be the result of some kind of a damage. For example, damage to the nerve pathways or brain signaling, which may contribute to the symptoms like the brain fog. For example, for the symptoms involving the loss of smell, this actually has been attributed to physical damage inside neurons, and even somewhat persistent brain damage, which actually takes months and months to repair. But in this study, the major focus was on the fourth potential source, the vascular system or blood vessels. And we know that COVID-19 infection does increase the risk for serious clotting issues. So things like, for example, pulmonary embolism and deep vein thrombosis has a much higher chance of appearing even months and months after the initial infection, which suggests that problems with blood coagulation or clotting seems to contribute to the varied symptoms. There's quite a lot of physical medical evidence behind this and quite a lot of studies that seem to suggest the same. And in some of the previous studies, scientists hypothesized that damage to the lining of the blood vessels may result in additional blood clots, thus producing symptoms. But this study focuses on something slightly different. The idea known as the microclots, possibly the result of some unusual structures inside the blood itself. Now, not so long ago, we actually discussed microclots as a result of microplastics inside our bodies. The video about this should be in the description below. 
So we actually know that today our bodies are filled with a lot of additional stuff that wasn't there just a few decades ago, so the chance for these microclots has increased quite dramatically. The video about this should be in the description. And well, microclots are not like your regular blood clots that you usually get when you, for example, cut yourself. In this case, normal blood clotting involves something known as fibrinogen molecules that usually self-assemble forming fibrin fibers and then create a long mesh designed to stop bleeding. This is of course a kind of a repair mechanism that our body relies on to prevent bleeding. And these normal clots are usually broken down by our body pretty quickly. This is known as the fibrinolysis. But microclots are not the same. They are very tiny and seem to create abnormally persistent blood clots but much, much smaller in size and in effect than the clots involved in conditions like the stroke or thrombosis. With most of these microclots also characterized by what scientists refer to as amyloid-like nature. Or basically they contain misfolded sticky protein structure, with the initial protein changing its shape and creating these very unusual structures. Structures that might resemble something like this. And this makes the resulting microclots highly resistant to being broken down by the body's natural processes, allowing them to clump together and form larger structures, and possibly creating blockage. And crucially, these microclots don't just contain fibrinogen, they also entrap various inflammatory molecules and proteins, including those that actively prevent clot from dissolving. And so here researchers show that the simple presence of the COVID spike proteins, referred to as S1, is enough to trigger the formation of these somewhat bizarre structures and start making them more robust and larger in size. But I guess the question is, are these actually important for the long COVID and could this be the actual source for many of these different symptoms? Well, we know that in healthy blood, microclots are extremely rare. But several studies using very precise detection methods now show that the total number of these microclots is dramatically higher in patients experiencing symptoms from the long COVID. And in one of the recent studies, the long COVID patients had a staggering 20 times increase in microclots compared to healthy individuals, with their clots also appearing to be much larger in size. And so now there is this new hypothesis. The hypothesis is that these small resistant clots seem to hinder blood flow through tiny capillaries, or very very tiny blood vessels inside the body, leading to widespread issues like oxygen deprivation in various tissues, which may explain certain symptoms including fatigue and brain fog. But I guess the biggest breakthrough was actually in this study we're discussing right now. This study built on previous discoveries of these microclots and looked at another factor frequently associated with inflammation and clotting, specifically something known as NETS, neutrophil extracellular traps. And in case you forgot biology, neutrophils are a type of a very specific white blood cells. Here's actually a really cool image showing us the so-called blood cell family, with neutrophils being one of these. And so when activated, specifically during severe infection, they very often launch these nets, essentially very sticky webs composed of their own DNA fibers and potent enzymes, meant to capture and eliminate any pathogen that triggered the infection. So this is something our body uses for defense all the time. And normally after doing their job, all of these nets quickly break down, with neutrophils returning back to the dormant state. But uncontrolled excessive net formation is also associated with various inflammatory diseases. And just like with the previous detection of microclots, here scientists also identified a very high concentration of these nets, specifically net markers, that was dramatically higher in patients with the long COVID compared to everyone else. With the main discovery from the study being a confirmation that microclots and nets are not just somehow correlated, they actually seem to be structurally related or connected. Here microscopy analysis demonstrated that many of these net markers seem to be physically embedded inside microclots, basically creating a structure that you see right here. And this structural association is critical. This basically suggests that a lot of these nets seem to promote stabilization of microclots inside bloodstream and encourage their formation and their growth. And if the microclots are wrapped in the sticky web of DNA and enzymes, the body's natural ability to dissolve them becomes dramatically impaired, so essentially these structures can now persist much, much longer, with this impairment leading to even more of these microclots, which then possibly causes many different effects linked to the long COVID. So at least some of these effects might be the result of these bizarre microclots. And so in this case we have our first definitive evidence that shows robust association between specific biomarkers inside the blood and chronic effects caused by long COVID, with the discovery of this structural link being vital for at least two reasons. 
Both of them are very important. Diagnosis and treatment. Because the levels and structural association of these markers are so different between healthy individuals and patients with long COVID, there is now immense potential for diagnostic testing, specifically by measuring concentrations of certain nets and the total number of microclots inside the blood, it's now possible to clearly establish if someone has long COVID just based on a blood sample. As a matter of fact, in this study, when scientists trained a machine learning tool to try to classify different samples of blood based on the presence of these nets and microclots, the accuracy was nearly 91%. And so there's a really, really high chance we now might have a way to diagnose this without just looking at the symptoms. This creates a very strong objective measurable signal that can dramatically improve diagnostic accuracy. But the second and the most important implication is treatment. If these nets are indeed stabilizing microclots and not the reason why there are so many inside the blood, this may suggest that there is now a target for some kind of a new medical treatment. Any drug that can target these net-based microclot complexes may actually be able to break them down completely and thus reduce potential symptoms associated with the long COVID. And in this case, because this is a very specific targeted drug, it may not even actually cause any other side effects because destroying these microclots should not really cause any negative effects. And so assuming that all of this is confirmed, there may now be potentially some kind of a cure for long COVID in the long term, assuming of course these studies are correct. Because here we still have to remember that this is not a cause and effect association. In this case, the long COVID patients did indeed have a higher level of these microclots and these nets, but maybe this is just a correlation, not a causation. So we do need to have more studies to try to confirm the proposed mechanism. Nevertheless, the study is still pretty important in helping us understand exactly what is happening with people that have long COVID. And myself, I actually know quite a few people around me that seem to be affected by this. And that's possibly offer some kind of a solution in the future. And so if this is indeed because of these very strange structures containing sticky nets, and a bunch of other stuff that forms amyloid-like microclots, well then the next step is going to be to try to cure this with a targeted drug. But if not, then we have to figure out why long COVID patients seem to have so many microclots and figure out what exactly this association is. Either way, we're slowly moving closer and closer to some of the potential answers and we'll hopefully have some kind of a therapy or some kind of a resolution in the next few years. We'll definitely come back if there are some other exciting discoveries. And until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access. You can also support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.